um, do I need to have any uh, like training before I can uh, join any groups? Like, uh, well, the usual thing is that when you join uh, the the lab, first of all, of course, you have some kind of interview, and during that interview, you are actually asking um, questions, and you are being asked to so. If the, if the group matches your expectations and if you are actually matching the expectations of the group. And of course, uh, during this interview, they will tell you what is expected from the student in this lab, etc. Don't worry if you don't know what this lab is doing because, well, almost never uh, people actually join the lab without preparation, etc. And it does not take much time to prepare also lots of stuff that are being used in these labs i mean instruments and tools and methods uh, you will have training anyway so don't worry about that mm -hmm. okay okay so it should be fine okay so the first problem in all of your reports well i only seen a few of them uh, is the title problem so um as i said before uh, during one of the lectures, the title is very, very important. So many people just don't um, understand how uh, it is important. And underestimation of this title is uh, really hits you back when you are done with the documentation. So uh, if you just write something like osmosis, uh, well, this title does not tell you anything about the experiment. So. Was, it, was this experiment about osmosis itself, uh, the part that actually tries to find um, the, um, the effects of hypotonic um, solutions on the cells, something that is related to the uh, net movement of the molecules through the biomembrane, or you were trying to find some, um, some, um, let's say you are comparing few semi-permeable membra membranes from different manufacturers. So this everything is actually within this osmosis. So if you just write something like osmosis, um, this general world, word is actually not telling you anything. So what you need to do, you need to explain uh, what this experiment about, okay? So you need to know um, the main aim of this, the main hypothesis and the aims of this experiment. And in this case, let's say for our uh, particular osmosis lab, the main hypothesis was uh, water molecules move from the um, uh, low concentration area, low concentration of solid to high concentration of solid area. Okay, so this is your hypothesis. So what is different? I mean, uh, how the aims and the hypothesis are different. So your hypothesis actually tells the fundamental principle, <clears throat> sorry, fundamental concept or principle of something. So in this case, when we talk about osmosis, we are talking about the movement of water. So this movement of water is the fundamental principle, okay? It happens because semi-permeable membrane does not allow big molecules go through. That's why the only um, member of the solution that can travel through is the water molecule. And we are studying water molecule uh, movement in this particular laboratory. That's why we use the fundamental concept for the identification of our hypothesis. So if you write something like hypothesis, um, try, um, try, what was, uh, so some people, they write something like, um, 
try the effect of uh, osmosis on bags with glucose. This is not the hypothesis. The hypothesis is water molecules move from the areas of low solid concentrations to the areas of high solid concentrations. And if this fundamental principle or fundamental concept is proven after we performed some kind of um, experiments, then our hypothesis is um, moving from hypothesis to theory. Of course, we need to perform lots of lots of experiments to prove it, but eventually, if it is uh, explaining the fundamental principle, then of course it moves to the category of the theory or axiom. Okay, and this is how it is different to the aims. So, if we talk about the aims now, uh, let's kill this everything. So, aims. Um, the aims are different to the hypothesis because they are explaining the steps, okay? The steps, how to test hypothesis. So we have the hypothesis which tells us that uh, water molecules move from high concentration, uh, from, sorry, low concentration to high concentration. Uh, areas of the solid. Okay, so how do we test it? Of course, um, the first aim would be uh, just put back of water into uh, glucose solution. Okay, so in this case, of course, just because we have semi permeable membrane, uh, the back will not um, allow the glucose get in. So what we expect coming from this hypothesis, we expect expected result. We expect the back lose mass. Why it happens? Because we hypothesize or we, uh, we assume that water moves from low solid concentration to high solid concentration areas. So these Conclusion comes uh, uh, from the hypothesis, okay? So the expected result comes from the uh, hypothesis. So, but this is only the first aim. The second aim is actually see how the back changes. Uh, sorry, I have a chat now. Uh, Yirlan, could you please repeat so that I understand because I did not understand your question. Uh, I mean, it seems like it, it is like a, an explanation of steps of the procedure. Like we put back in the glucose solution and uh, so I it will doesn't explain sound like the aim. Okay, so aims are related to the procedure. So how they are related? Because they determine the protocol, okay? So first of all, you actually show uh, the aim, how to test the hypothesis. And uh, you, you don't need to, to be scared to show something that is written in the protocol because again, protocol depends on aims. Because if the aim does not ask you to perform one action or something, uh, some procedure, then why using that protocol, right? So the protocol is the dependent part. Um, and this part is dependent on the aims. So we first determine how we approach the testing of the hypothesis, and then we choose the protocol. To, to, to perform or to reach the goal, the aim. Okay, so uh, we talked about the first aim, which actually shows the movement of water from the back. And now we want to see if we put 
um, high solute uh, solution into the back and then we put back into the um, uh, into the distilled water so what happens actually we expect according to this hypothesis we expect that it will change the mass so it will increase because the water will move to the back in this case right so this is your second goal finally to make sure that um, uh, the, the water molecule is really dependent on the concentrations and it is not kind of random movement of the molecules. We also have the third aim here. So we put back with water into water and see how it, uh, how it changes the mass. The thing is, if we have uh, in one experiment, we have bag of water dropping its mass in water um, medium and in another experiment we have bag of water increasing its mass then of course it proves our hypothesis incorrect so it tells us that the movement of water is not dependent on the concentration of the solid okay so here we have three distinct aims and each of them is actually showing you a part of the experiment, okay? And of course, uh, because, just a second, Amina, because we have these three aims, we will have to uh, write some kind of procedure protocol or procedure plan to test every single, uh, every single aim here. So this is why we have the um, aims very dependent on the hypothesis because they actually determine the whole experiment. And, well, I was actually talking about the title. Okay, so Amina, it's your turn now. Uh, I wanted to ask, when we write the hypothesis, should we uh, give a brief explanation? For example, um, uh, May I read my hypothesis? I can you hear me? Yes, of course. Ah, uh, so uh, for example, uh, I wrote the mass of the solution uh, with high salt concentration will undergo greatest change compared to other solutions due to movement of water in the system. So, should is it correct to write a brief explanation, or do we just state what would what we expect to happen? So what you actually explained is the expected result, right? So yes. uh, in the articles, sometimes you see uh, in introduction, introduction after the declaration of the hypothesis. So first they declare, well, they give background uh, information. And in the last part, they give the, they declare the hypothesis. Then they tell you aims that they want to reach and finally, uh, they actually might to show, they might show expected results, expected. And these expected results is something that you just explained a minute ago. Okay, so uh, what you shown is the expected result uh, for one of the aims of yours. Um, of course, you could give this small explanation because, uh, well, why not? Um, if you if you said, uh, let's say that you have these hypotheses, then you shown the aims and made some kind of predictions. And finally, after you discussed the results of your, of your experiment, and you actually compare the results to the expected results. And if they match, then of course your hypothesis is proven. Okay, so uh, it is not bad to explain it a little because it actually shows how, uh, how you approach the problem. Because if you approach it in a way that you expect something, then of course you thought about the experiment before you started doing, uh, conducting the experiment. And it tells everyone that you are very serious about your work. So uh, it will not hurt 
to explain it a little. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Uh, now, um, well, this everything was actually to show you the um, the the importance of the title. <laughs> so in this case, I explained everything about the hypothesis and the aims. And of course, uh, the title here would be very important and it is uh, really depends on the uh, hypothesis that you do and the aims of the experiment. Hypothesis, because here you say something like osmosis, period, and then you show the experiment. And because experiment is based on some kind of protocol and protocol is based on the aims that you set to test your hypothesis, of course, the title is also dependent on the um, hypothesis and the aims. Okay, so we have kind of um, dependency tree here. So first, uh, the, the level zero is your hypothesis. It actually orchestrates everything. Then we have the first dependent and it is your level one, which are aims. Then we have level three and level three is your protocol. Also here we have title. And now dependent of the protocol is your materials section. Also materials, uh, um, apart from the material sections, all, also your results. Because they explain what happened uh, when we use this protocol. Um, and this is our level four dependence. Finally, we have level five dependence. And in this case, we have discussion. And it is purely dependent on the, on the results. Of course, because the hypothesis is the top level, the discussion is also dependent on the hypothesis, but through the chain of aims, protocol, results, and then discussion, okay? Finally, what is conclusion here? Conclusion is actually compare, comparison of aims and hypothesis to what actually we received in the, in the last discussion um, section. So we actually have the level six, and level six is your conclusion. And here we compare the level six with our level one and through level one, we compare it to levels uh, zero, okay? So this is the end of the whole experiment of the whole laboratory work. But uh, of course it is dependent on the discussion. Oops, sorry. It is dependent on the discussion. So this is the, the dependency tree and why you actually need to explain everything here. So we were talking about the title. So why uh, you need a very good title? Because in three years, you will need to repeat some kind of, exp of experiment, okay? And you, by three uh, year time, you will have, let's say, three lab books, written lab books. And of course, every lab book will have the table of contents of contents. And with these three lab books, you will have, uh, let's say, five uh, entities, and each entity is called osmosis. So entity one, two, three, etc., or even more than than five. And if you have very simple, very general uh, name in here, of course, you will have to go through every single lab book, through every single experiment to understand what it was about. Well, the good thing here would be showing um, the relatedness to the topic. So in this case, osmosis, or you don't really need to show the, 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 the general part here. Uh, but the main part here is to explain what the experiment is about. Okay, so uh, what you could do here, you write something like osmosis, trial of uh, semi-permeable membranes. And you already know that you were testing the membranes here and you were choosing these, uh, the best membrane on the market. 
And of course, because you wrote something like this, in addition to osmosis, you don't need to go to this first lab book, to this first trial, just because you don't need the, um, you don't need the stuff that was done there. You actually need the hypertonic condition that you tested, uh, let's say the, the last osmosis, hypertonic condition on condition on embryonic stem cell. And of course, uh, without this explanation of the experiment, you will not be able to find it very fast. And uh, why the title is dependent on aims and hypothesis, because um, in one sentence, you explain the whole experiment. Okay, okay so uh, the title will help you in the future. So don't un underestimate it. And uh, if you write osmosis, explain what happened next experiment. Also, sometimes it's better to use active voice just, uh, just because, well, it's a general convention now that um, scientists, they use active voices in the titling of the articles, etc. So if you start practicing this active voice titling of your experiments, etc., then when you actually start writing an article, um, it will be easy for you to write it. Uh, believe me, many people who are on the level of postdoc, who never practiced with active voices, they, um, they just cannot name their articles and um, it really hits the, uh, the ratings of this article, etc. So why it happens? Just because again, title is um, showing the whole experiment or sometimes the whole uh, experimental pro project in one single sentence. And if the person never had any experience with writing the active voice um, title, then of course they will make a very bad, um, bad job. Uh, very, how to say that? Uh, they will actually make harm to themselves. Okay, so even if they have a very brilliant article and very bad title, Mm, this will actually divert people from reading this article. So if you start practicing right now with the active voices in the title, then you will be able to uh, give a very fancy name to your article. And well, I actually seen uh, many papers in very good journals that were having very attractive titles. And I mean, with the active voice, etc. And I read them. Although uh, this part, I mean, the, the whole paper was not of my interest. It is just because the title was catchy. Okay, so it caught my uh, attention and I just went there and read everything and I actually enjoyed the reading, etc. Because when the person knows how to uh, title their work concisely and in a very informative way, then of course they know how to write the whole article. It is just a general rule. The more you practice, the better you are. Okay, so this is um, the, the first part about the title itself. Now let's move to hypothesis and aim. So I explained almost everything here, but uh, again, this is the reminder. So in your hypothesis and aims, don't use just general uh, words like we test osmosis because testing osmosis is impossible because it's a huge area of physics, of chemistry, of biology, and you cannot test it, okay? So if you use general words, they hit you back because, well, I am fine with, uh, with, with, with marking just because I know how difficult it is for you to write in a very academic way. But of course, not everyone um, is like me because some people, they just, well, I mean, some professors, they just feel kind of um, scratched when they see general wording uh, in, the, in the work. So they actually might reduce your mark, although your whole 
experiment was done in a very appropriate way. So avoid general words, avoid kind of, uh, in Russian it's wordy writing, right? So, um, of course, the main understanding is that there is no experiment without hypothesis and aims because they are level zero and level one. If you don't have the basis, then you don't have the building. So no fund fundament, no building. The same goes here. Level zero and level one are something that you build your experiment on top of. Okay. So here also, the aims, they define the plan. And I already told that because Yerlan was asking, well, sorry, was it Yerlan? So um, the aims, they defined plan. And because we had three aims, uh, so first one is testing water in the back. Uh, then second one, testing glucose in the back. Finally, testing water in water. So these are three different topics, three different aims. And because of that, we will have three different graphs or three different tables, actually. Okay, so many people made a mistake because they combined the whole, uh, all these three aims into one single um, graph. This is not what you are supposed to do because the aims are testing different sides of your hypothesis. And because they are testing the different sides, they cannot be combined on the same, um, uh, same graph or same table. Well, table is fine uh, if you understand how to actually separate the results. If you don't know how to separate the results, then probably um, different tables should be explaining different approaches to the hypothesis or different aims, okay? Um, and as I said, because aims are level one and results are somewhere um, below, so level three or four, then of course, everything that is written in results is depending on the aims. So please make sure that you understand this dependency tree because it is crucial. And if you understand how it works, you will be the superman or superwoman of the lab. Because again, many people of PhD or postdoc level, they just don't understand these dependencies. And because of that, they make lots of mistakes that, well, uh, the mistakes that should not be making, um, should, should not be made, okay? So this is something that people just forget to teach when they are teachers and people forget to learn when they are students. Okay, so hypothesis and aims. I hope that you guys understand how it works. Mm, now let's talk about materials and methods. And also we will touch pre and post labs um, because um, they come also about the same problem here. Okay, so materials and methods. Again, methods, they are uh, the next level of the aims, so the, the dependency tree. They are very important because in this case, you define what you are going to use as materials. So materials are only possible to define when we have the methods to use to be used. Okay, so we know aims. So th these are um, what we want to test, okay? And so what, what we want to test. So the methods are how we want to test. And in this how we have the materials because um, they actually define. So let's say that you have a protocol for DNA extraction. Will you need master mix for your PCR in this DNA extraction? 
Of course not. So your materials, they are dependent on the methods. So please make sure that you understand what is going on here. Uh, because although they are written, like materials are written uh, prior to the methods, the methods are actually uh, higher level than the materials. And sometimes people, again, in the lab, uh, people with a huge experience in their, uh, in their backpack, they just don't understand this dependency and they make mistakes. So what we ask you to do in the materials and methods, we want you to show it in a paragraph text. So please don't make it bullet pointed or as an ordered lists. There is no need to do that because it takes lots of uh, space. And again, when you start writing articles, you will understand how crucial it is to keep everything very concise, very simple in understanding. And um, this paragraph text is the best way to reduce the, the, the number of pages, etc. Believe me, if I see um, an article with this ordered list for materials and methods, I understand that this person did not work well a lot. So they just didn't give, um, didn't pay attention to writing their articles because this is very important. Okay, so another side of this conciseness uh, is that some people, they don't understand what is concise. They just think that if they write one word, it is enough. No, incomplete. <clears throat> incomplete means incorrect. If you write something concise, it does not mean that it should be um, explained in one single word. It might be explained in few sentences, but given a very uh, small amount of non-needed stuff, okay? So I've seen lots of these mistakes in the pre and post labs. So many of you actually, uh, when we ask you to write something, many of you think that you work in a concise way. No, you actually work in an incomplete way. So please make sure that you understand what is concise and what is incomplete. So if we ask you define something or describe something and then show calculations, We really ask you to define something first and then show your calculations. So uh, wait a second, I have a chat. Okay, so the question from Jean Saya, uh, in your manuals, the methods and materials are already written. Do you need to rewrite them? Sometimes um, the videos are given in a very straightforward way. So in the video, uh, we actually follow the protocol. Okay, so if it is happening, then of course you can uh, just copy it, but make sure that it is not given in, an, in a list way. It is given in a paragraphs. Okay, so you could copy them and it will not make any mistakes to your, it will not make any harm to your final grade. But if we change something, so let's say that in your protocol that is given in your mod, mod, uh, manual, we say that we put, uh, put the cells at 37 Celsius degrees. But on your video, we actually put them into 32 Celsius degrees. You have to show it in your, uh, in your materials and method uh, section. Please make sure that you watch the video and you know the, the protocol because it will actually teach you how to approach your uh, future research work. So, um, as always, uh, the main part here is know your work. So, how you do that? First of all, you read everything, then you uh, approach people who already done it, and after that, after you, uh, you were kind of trained by those people, you can perform your work. I, again, I, I seen many people who just try to start straightforward without knowing what they do, without talking to people who already done this work. Please don't be such people. Okay, so in this case, again, 
read the manual before you watch the video <clears throat> and compare this manual to what you see in the video. And again, when you come to the laboratory in a, um, I mean, um, when we have offline laboratories, you also need to know the protocol beforehand. Please do that because without it, you will not be able to compare it to what you do, to your actual, um, to your actual steps. And if you don't know what was changed, then you of course cannot document it. And if you cannot document it, then of course you lose a whole experiment. And I mean, lose the future you loses this experiment because you will not be able to, to repeat it. So please know your protocol beforehand. Okay, so I was talking about the... Um, and post labs. Okay, so here we have. Um, sometimes we have a question that asks you to define something, and after the, the definition, we ask you to show your calculations or describe something and then show your calculations. It is meaning that you have to give the definition and then show the calculations. So it's kind of two part question. Uh, most of you. Uh, for the definition or preparation of the solution and showing the calculations, only shown the calculations, something like uh, glucose mass is equal to uh, molecular weight times concentration times um, volume. Well, I could do that myself. I mean, the calculation and why I need to ask you. It's just because the first part asks you to describe how you prepare the, the solution. And the solution is actually prepared. So you weight, you weigh the, the glucose, you put it in a beaker, then you, um, here we have one liter, uh, then you put some water in, you make sure that it is mixed well, and finally you bring to volume of one liter. This is what the description here, okay? Make sure that your answers are really concise and full instead of getting uh, the incomplete because incomplete is incorrect. Make sure that you do that. And of course, materials and methods, <clears throat> sorry, materials and methods are also kind of obeying the same rules. Make them concise, but complete. So. Please work with that because the more you practice, the better you are at being concise. Okay, so this is about materials and methods. And now we switch to the next part, the next level. And the next level is the results section. So the results section is dependent on the methods. Why I say that? Because um, here you will be showing what you got after um, going through the steps of your protocol. And going through the steps of the protocol give you the table, the figure, the graphs. And of course, they should not be given as table one. And that's it. Why? Because again, uh, the methods, they explain the aims, how you approach the aims, right? And results is actually explaining you what you received, what you received in the end and if you just write something like table one it does not tell anything okay what it is about what aim it approaches or what aim it is explaining okay so make sure that you give a title a title might be something like um, dependency of mass of the back onto concentration of the glucose within. Okay, so does it tell you anything? Of course it does. It actually tells you what you are expecting to see as the results. Because again, in your aims, you, you were predicting something. And here you see if the, if the predictions are uh, met or not, okay? Uh, these tables, if you see articles, uh, with tables, figures, or graphs without the titles, 
you just can throw them out because throw them away because these articles are about nothing. The person who was writing those articles paid um, zero seconds to actually care about the reader. So what happens when you don't give the titles for the supplementary data? Um, actually, if you don't give the title, the person should go through the whole protocol and understand uh, what is actually in this single table. And of course, it takes much time. And uh, well, no one wants to spend time, and especially in research and science, because researchers and scientists, they mm, don't have time at all. Well, most of the time you read the articles while you, while you eat your lunch. So this is how uh, short the scientists are on time. And of course, if the person did not care about the reader, then why reading this uh, article? Why reading this piece of work? So make sure that you give the, the titles to the tables, to the figures or graphs, because this actually defines how you are caring about people who read it. So also in your reports, I did not see, uh, well, I might have seen only one single uh, lab book which explains the results in text. So you usually give the tables, uh, you draw some graphs and that's it. So this is not how it happens. So you have to give the textual uh, explanation of the tables and the textual explanation of the graphs. Okay, so uh, why it happens? Because, well, you know that we are different people. Some people, they like tables, they like some visual content, etc. Others, they love, absolutely love textual information. So what you could say, uh, well, to kind of care about everyone, um, about both of the groups of people who like visual information or textual information, you could actually give them both. So you give tables, figures, and graphs, and then you explain them in text. Also, why it is important to explain it in text, just because um, sometimes um, the, 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 the single graph does not explain much. So uh, some of the results uh, they cannot be put, just put on the graph. You have to use some other type of delivering the information. And this type is your textual information. So in this textual information, for example, here you have minus 98% of the uh, mass change. Of course, here you have huge drop of this particular uh, graph. If the person looks at these guys, and sees this 98, they can actually skip it. I mean, they can, uh, they can be busy and just don't pay much attention to this guy. And this is actually your outlier. And you declare it in the textual part of your results. In your results, you write something like, we have an outlier. So we identify this outlier using these and this and these techniques and it is really an outlier because uh, it is 1.9 uh, interquartile range uh, from the uh, from the uh, quarter three, for example. Okay, so you say that you don't give any um, thoughts about this outlier. You just say it because uh, you want people. You want people to pay attention to this particular part. And without this textual information, they might actually just skip it because they did not pay much attention to what they read. And of course, in this case, they will go back to your uh, table. They will look how the graph is actually behaving. And then they will um, kind of make their own conclusions based on these information. Just because you delivered another piece of information in your text. So please make sure that you have both text and visual uh, representation of information. So these are your results. And now we switch to, well, 
some people say that it is the main part of the article or the main part of the research. So we are talking about um, the discussion. And in this case, discussion, again, it is one of the lowest levels of the experiment. But um, in, in this discussion, you actually make your, um, make your main thoughts speak out. Okay, so what you say here, you say about outliers that you found during these experiments, you say about the problems that you found during these experiments, and of course you give the thoughts. And these thoughts, because everything is dependent on hypothesis and aims, they are about hypothesis and aims. Of course, problems might be related to some protocol, not really the aim, but also sometimes uh, after the whole experiment, people understand that they used very different protocol that is not reflecting the aims. Just a second. Uh, so the question from Amina, uh, so you should provide results uh, for every aim separately. Yes, if you have the one single aim, then the results will be explaining this particular aim and the protocol that is related to this aim. If you have three different aims, uh, you might have three subsections. Okay, so the first subsection, which is actually uh, behavior of water bag in a high solid um, concentrated solution. Okay. You write it and then you give the results that are only related to this part. Next, you will have another subsection. So again, try to start reading articles now and you will see lots of it. Uh, you will see lots of subsections in the, um, in the articles. So you will see very thick writing like results. And then very small writing like um, subheading. Okay, so if this is your H1 in HTML, then you have H3 as your sub subsection. And in this case, it might be again, something like behavior of water in high concentration uh, solution. Next would be your high concentration back in water. And finally, we might have actually the water in water. And for each of them, you will have different results. Because they are related to different parts of the experiment, right? So for the discussion, you don't have to have these subsections because you actually try to understand the whole experiment, how it behaved, what you received in the end, did you prove your hypothesis? Did you reach your aims, etc.? This is where you discuss everything. Okay, so you don't need to have these subsections there. But if you really want to show these subsections, you are absolutely fine to do that. So if you want to do that, no one will stop you, okay, in the discussion. But if you had different aims and, of course, results, then you absolutely have to give them separately. You cannot give them in, a, in the same uh, graph just because they are not related to the same part of the experiment, okay? So um, this is again about the discussion, why everyone loves the discussion, because the main, um, the main problems are explained there, uh, also some, um, explanation of the results uh, that might be outliers. So why we receive those outliers, how we approach uh, the experiment again, not to have these outliers, etc. cetera. This goes to the discussion. So I've seen many people writing like uh, minus 98% change of mass. So they write it in the results section and they straight away explain why they have this minus 98% uh, change of mass. So again, explanation, explanation belongs to the discussion. 
make sure that you put it in the discussion. And you also need to reference it uh, in the results section. So when you explain it in discussion, you say something like, as seen on table one, um, let's say raw, sorry, raw 1.2, uh, molar concentrated glucose uh, in group two we have the outlier and you explain why you have it so we actually might have um, tightened it very loosely that's why uh, the the glucose actually went out and we were left with this huge change of mass you can say that in you can explain it in the discussion and you should be referencing your results section because it's a very good way to actually show that you worked you worked on the writing of your uh, uh, report your article or your lab book okay uh, so why this discussion is important because again in three years time you come back to this particular lab book and you don't want to read all these uh, results. So you just go straight to discussion, you read it. And well, your memory is actually a very strange thing because after reading your, your own thoughts, you will remember everything else. You will remember how it went, what, what, what were the problems with the protocol, et cetera. But you need to touch these thoughts written somewhere. And if you read, if you wrote them in the discussion three years ago, and then you touch them, then you of course um, um, you understand everything straight away, etc. So this is how you help yourself, and this is why I absolutely require you to separate results and uh, discussion. I've seen many people writing like results and discussion in the same section. Please separate it because it is easy to write everything in the same section. But again, you, uh, you hit yourself in the future because you don't practice on separating your own thoughts and the results. And if you work on this separation now, then you will be uh, absolutely happy um, first of all, of course, to write the articles in a very appropriate way when you have results and discussions separated, but also sometimes when you are asked to combine them, you will do it in a very easy way, just because you know how everything is done um, without combining those sections. And this is why I ask you to separate results and discussion. I don't want to see a single section written like this, OK? So this is about the discussion and finally the conclusion. Uh, as I said, in this conclusion, we actually compare the level 0 and 1 to our last or the lowest, uh, lowest layer or lowest level of the whole work. So you got the understanding of the whole experiment. And now you compare it to, to the setup, to the hypothesis and the aims. And here you write something like, um, the experiment proved that our hypothesis is rubbish. Okay. And you know that it is rubbish straight away, just because before that you had the discussion. And in this discussion, you actually explained why it's rubbish. And now you just make uh, the whole conclusion for the whole experiment by comparing these levels together. Okay, so don't write something like, um, in conclusion, don't write something like minus 98% outlier was found and we dealt with that, et cetera, et cetera, because this part does not belong to the conclusion. Everything that is written in conclusion should be belonging to this comparison here. Aims and hypothesis versus experiment. So 
aims and hypothesis is something like prediction. And your experiment is something like reality. Now you make them clash and see if the predictions actually explain the reality or they predict the reality and vice versa. This is everything goes to conclusion. Nothing else. No outliers, no thoughts, no problems, no uh, explanation of the small uh, pitfalls, etc. Only the prediction versus reality. That's it. Nothing else. So uh, I explained this everything, and now I want to show you uh, the common mistake. So we had, again, we had the common table that actually explains three different experiments. So first experiment is showing the um, bags with different concentrations of glucose in water. In water and in water. So this is the uh, experiment number one or sub-experiment if you want to. So the next experiment is actually um, water in water. So this is your sub-experiment number two. And finally, you have the last experiment. So we have water in glucose, in glucose and in glucose. So this is your experiment number three or sub-experiment number three. These are different because they explain different aims. Well, actually, you might say that uh, you could put experiment number two and experiment number three together. Of course you could, but it's better to separate them because the setup is different. So the setup for the experiment number three is putting water in glucose, while experiment number two is water in water. So technically, they are not the same. They show something, but they don't explain the same principle. So the experiment number two is actually testing if the water behaves um, kind of uh, predictable. Okay, so it's not random movement. It is actually kind of controlled movement. And we can control it by changing the concentrations of solid. Controlled movement. And of course, because you did not uh, see that we actually have three different experiments, you put them all together and uh, you say something like G1, uh, which is incorrect here, um, showing the raise of the mass, then it shows drop of the mass and further drop of the mass. It is not correct, why? Because you combine three different experiments. Okay, so here um, you also have the average. And in this case, so let me show it like this. So because you still have this outlier here, your average actually goes very steep down. And if we compare these two graphs together, so you could see that they don't behave the same way. And actually this change here shows you that there is some kind of randomness in the movement of water. And this outlier actually kills your uh, hypothesis. So you need to fight the outliers. And because you, um, you are the first uh, year student, you actually might not understand what is outlier. So the outlier is the random, absolutely random value obtained in the experiment. And this random value, uh, it is a false result of your experiment, okay? So it is not related on your hypothesis because the hypothesis is the top level uh, of your experiment, right? And this random value, because it is not related to the hypothesis, you should get rid of it. Because if you don't get rid of it, this randomness actually contributes to the testing of your hypothesis. And this randomness actually might 
kill a very good experiment just because people thought that they performed it in a way that is inappropriate, okay? So define the outlier, fight it, and then uh, see um, if, if the hypothesis is actually behaving similar in different setups of the experiment. So why we have class average is to see the general trend. So if you obtain this trend here, and your class obtained very similar one, of course, it means that um, the, the, the fundamental concept of osmosis is not dependent on the person who is doing it, who is, do, who is making the, conducting the experiment. So if you, if you perform the same experiment in uh, Alpha Centauri, So on one of its planets, it should still behave similarly, which means that um, the, the, the hypothesis is actually proven, okay? That's why you want to have averages and you want to compare them and you really want to get rid of these outliers. Okay, so I said that it is not correct. So how the correct one should look like? Uh, it should look like this. So in this case, I took two parts only. So the first one is actually asking um, if, if the higher concentrations of solids will have higher change of mass. And we actually see it. So we have the rise like this. And uh, in this case, we actually might see something like this so the trend line here might actually go like this and it might explain a very uh, good fundamental concept mm, so if you remember uh, the hypothesis was water molecules move from low concentration of solid to high concentration of solid areas does this graph explain it? Yes, of course. So now you have the average of the class. So you combine them together and you see that the general trend is actually uh, the same. And it really means that on another planet or under another condition, which is reflecting your conditions, um, the, the hypothesis will behave the same. And of course, it proves the hypothesis correct, okay? So now let's see uh, the second part. So in this case, again, uh, we can take, we, we, well, we actually have to take this particular part as the independent uh, variable. So in this case, we see that um, the average of the uh, water in water change of mass is very close to 0%. And of course, it tells you that, well, again, uh, the behavior of water in water um, is predicted because we have water movement from, high, from low concentration to high concentration areas. And if we don't have the difference in these concentrations, then the water should not move. And because it does not move, we have the zero change of the, of the mass. And this actually proves it. We don't have any, uh, any randomness in movement of water. So why I put it here, just to show you that um, we can actually put 100 here. So 95, 90, 85, 80, 75, 60, 65. Okay, so um, this zero or um, absence of change of mass is your 100%. So this is where you could possibly combine these two experiments, okay? But again, um, they are different because here we have different media. So, um, well, technically, this water in water might be explained as water in water back in zero concentrated solute. 
again, technically you could do. That's why you could show it as 100%, okay? Well, now what next happens? Uh, because we remove this outlier here, because minus 98 is really out of this set. So we have set minus 40, minus 42, and minus 38. So 98 looks very random value here. That's why we removed it. And now we are left only with three values. So we find the uh, average of it, and the average is minus 40. So now we draw the trend uh, of the combined averaged values. And here we have uh, almost the same graphs. And it actually tells you that your work or sorry, your work and your hypothesis are, are reflecting something that is real. I mean, the, the concept that actually, um, the concept that is happening in our universe, okay? So this averaging and repeating of the experiment shows that uh, it is something fundamental. The same goes for any type of research. So let's say that you say, uh, killing cells with, uh, let's say, glucose uh, is very um, efficient in cancerous patients, okay? so in oncological patients. And you prove it, and then you write an article about it. And then people from uh, other parts of the, of, the, of the earth, they try to repeat it, and they see that actually... Mm, glucose does not kill uh, does not kill the cancerous cells specifically, okay? And it really means that your work is not fundamental. Okay, so that's why we need this averaging and repeating of the experiment, etc. So this is about this part. So I guess we are uh, finished now.